This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we bring you part two of our conversation with celebrated writer Valeria Luiselli, who's just published her fifth book, her first novel written in English. It's called Lost Children Archive. The stunning book chronicles one family's journey from New York to the southwestern U.S.-Mexico border in Arizona. They take the road trip for the unnamed mother's research on the plight of migrant children seeking refuge in the United States. The Los Angeles Review of Books writes, Lost Children Archive brings into sharp focus the deep wrongs that are being inflicted upon immigrant children in our name. It demands that our numbed complacency be shaken and our rage unleashed. Valeria Luiselli, thank you for continuing this conversation. So, take us on the journey you went um, in this book, in this novel, and also talk about um, why you chose to write a novel. Right. Well, um, as I was telling you earlier, I, I took a road trip with my family in 2014. Um, what I wanted to do that summer was take a road trip in South Africa, because I, I was writing a novel about my childhood in post-apartheid South Africa. But that wasn't possible, because I had just applied for a green card, and uh, well, a few months before. And you can't leave the country while you're waiting for uh, an answer. So we decided to, to, to go on a road trip. Also, we decided if we're asking for green cards, we might as well really get to know the country we're, we're going to live in. So um, we took a road trip from Manhattan to Arizona, uh, very slowly winding down and, uh, into the country. And um, my idea, first of all, was to take Polaroid pictures as we drove, uh, because I was going to send them back to friends in South Africa, asking them questions about um, landscape or childhood there. So it was a bit of a of, of an experiment to, to, to be able to continue writing that other novel, which I then abandoned. I did take the, those, those pictures, and, but I started the reality. I, I'm a kind of writer that, that cannot vacuum pack herself uh, outside immediate reality. I, I, I've never written in a space of absolute um, fiction, right? So I, I started documenting what I was seeing instead of thinking about the other novel. I started documenting um, the abandoned motels and the many military planes uh, that flew uh, and hovered above us, and the industrialized landscape uh, raped by heavy machinery, and the small towns of hardworking people, and the beautiful mountains, and the deserts, and the diners. And so, so this, this um, landscape that was, that was emerging before me, with all its beauty and all its abandonment, um, and all its possibility. And at the same time, as we were driving, um, I, I was listening. We're radio junkies, and I, all the time to the radio. And of course, what was on the radio that summer was the, the children's crisis at the border, right? It was— And this was during the Obama years. This was, of course, during the Obama years. I mean, it must be said that ice boxes, yeleras, which are caged— uh, spaces with little facilities at freezing temperatures uh, existed then, and family separation existed then, too, not at the level in which it exists now. Uh, but all of this was already, was already there, right? Unfortunately, that crisis left the, the headlines um, very, very soon. So as I continued to write this novel, uh, after having gone on that road trip, uh, I was by then working in immigration court um, as a screener and translator for children who had been bumped up in their priority cases in, in court. They, they now only had children who were seeking asylum back then only had 21 days to get a lawyer to defend them against deportation, as opposed to a year, which was which is what they traditionally had. So many volunteers all over the country were needed to to face that crisis, and um, and I was among them. And I was hearing testimonies uh, of kids that, of course, told their reasons for leaving, the unspeakable horrors that they faced, and that that made them leave their country. It was death or coming here and possibly 
surviving the journey and then possibly finding safety. Um, and I— And I, I just have to ask you, yeah, although yeah. we have talked about this before when you were here, when you're in the court translating, <clears throat> how you're feeling, because you are not only a translator of language, but there you are in a court with a child who doesn't speak English, and you're translating for them, but you're also understanding the cultural context, and you're understanding what the judge is understanding, and how much more you want to say mm -hmm. as uh, this child speaks. Right. There's many. There's. It's very complex, and there's many levels of translation that are simultaneously going on when when you're screening or interviewing a, a child and translating their their story. Uh, first of all, they're children, so the the questions that that are often being posed to them are ones that they that they maybe don't fully understand. And the younger the child, that's a very sad thing. The younger the child, the less likely he or she is to give a good enough story that will then become a case that uh, a lawyer then takes. Uh, so I remember speaking to very young girls, um, a couple of sisters in particular, who, um, who had come here from Guatemala and who, who had traveled here with the num telephone number of their mother stitched to their collar, <laughs> so, because they wouldn't remember the number. They were very little. And they had made it to the border. and. Uh, someone had, they had shown an official their, the telephone number that they had stitched, and their mother was contacted. And they had made it all the way to their mother. So they were not lost in the system. They actually made it here. But when they started narrating their story, it became clear that the case was not going to be deemed strong enough for them to stay with their mother here. And um, I never knew what happened with those two, two girls. Um, and those two girls became the haunting presence in the heart of, of the novel, of Lost Children Archive. I talk about them in, in Tell Me How It Ends, but they come up again as, as the, the two lost presences, as the absent presences that m motivate um, the narrator in the novel uh, along her way. Um, I, I actually don't know how that story ended. I don't know if those girls are here or were deported or... Um, but I, I, of course, one fears the West, the, the West. One fears the West as well, <laughs> but one fears the worst. As you were telling us in part one, this is the story of the couple, uh, husband and wife, and their two children in the back seat, um, driving across America to the border, uh, and this merging of histories. Right. So, as the family drives across the U.S., the the father is working on a documentary, on a sound documentary, about the Tirikawa Apaches, and specifically about Geronimo and, and Chief Cochise, and is constantly telling his children stories uh, about the Apaches and about these last group of Apaches in particular, who were the last free people to surrender in the American continent to what uh, were then called the White Eyes, right? And it was the, the last free peoples to surrender. So he's, he's telling the story of the lost, uh, of a lost civilization or of a, of a lost, um, a lost peoples in the sense of, of, of a peoples having lost their freedom finally and the last ones to lose that. And the children listen to all these stories very attentively. And at the same time, the mother is uh, listening to the radio constantly. Um, and in the radio, all the news is about um, the crisis at the border, often not the humanitarian crisis, or it's not being framed like a humanitarian crisis, but more an institutional crisis. Um, called a crisis on the basis of the fact that there, that there has been a, a big surge of arrivals and um, and institutions are cramped and everything is backlogged and so but the, the children hear all of this and in their backseat games they start reenacting uh, what they hear mixing it all up and all of this uh, started for me or I, I, I started thinking in these terms about reenactment when with my um, my daughter and stepsons, I, I went to uh, one of those bizarre reenactment towns uh, where uh, gunfights are reproduced endlessly between cow different cowboys. And um, I was very surprised in this reenactment town uh, in Arizona, Tombstone, um, where there were, we, we went to a gunfight between, I don't know, I think Billy the Kid and Wyatt Earp, uh, 
and Dog Holiday, and then we left that, and there was another Billy the Kid and another. And then you walk around this town, and there's like five Billy the Kids that maybe often see each other. And it kind of blew my mind that it's a, I find it a very bizarre cultural practice. Like the, the idea of reproducing history, one or a small episode in history, over and over again for entertainment and consumption, and I guess some it has some didactic didactic component. We ended up taking a, a family, one of those cheesy family portraits in, in, in this town, Tombstone, Arizona. We have to dress as, the, as, as a person from the era. The kids wanted this, etc. So we went and they, we got a menu uh, of who we could be. So you could either be Doc Holliday or Wyatt Earp or Billy the Kid or the generic Mexican outlaw or the generic uh, Native American. As a Mexican, you can understand that I wasn't so pleased um, the, the genericness of my identity. So we ended up all dressing as Mexican outlaws and Native Americans, and, and we had the TZ family portrait. But then, of course, I mean, um, I, I began thinking about the, the politics of reenactment, right? Who gets to have a name? and who gets to have a part in history, right? So my, my characters are all unnamed um, in, a, in an attempt to be coherent with, with uh, my dismay at, at who gets to be mapped into history with a name and who doesn't. Uh, but it's really also a novel about reenactment, and not only as, as a, this bizarre cultural practice, but as also an internalized uh, emotional and intellectual procedure that uh, maybe allows you to reckon with the, the distant past or an immediate present that seems either too unlikely or too far from your own circumstances. So the kids in the novel, through reenacting, bring the, the more distant past of the Apache Chiricahua nation closer to them and, of course, the plight of child migrants arriving at the border uh, close to their hearts as well. And, and in, in, it is in their play, in their form of storytelling, that the effort to pass stories from one generation to the next, I think, is, is wholly realized. I wanted to flip from your novel, Lost Children Archive, to what's happening today, something you're very tapped into. And this explosive hearing that took place this week, where the Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen was being um, questioned by a group of Democratic Congress members, really challenged about the separating of children. And I wanted to turn to this one moment when this New Jersey Congress member, Bonnie Watson Coleman, questioned Secretary Nielsen. What is a um, chain link fence enclosed into a, um, a chamber? on a concrete uh, floor represent to you. Is that a cage? It's a detention space, ma'am, that you know has existed for decades. Does it differ from the cages you put your dogs in when you let them stay outside? Is it, a, is it different? It, it, yes. In what sense? Uh, it's larger. It has facilities. Uh, it provides room to sit, to stand, to lay down. So did my dog's cage. So did my dog's cage. As you listen to this and as your book has just come out, um, and as you were translating for children during the Obama years, and now Trump has intensified this situation with the— I mean, it's not as if children—no children were separated from their parents during the Obama years, but he brought it to a new level. Well, I mean, first of all, I— you don't have to be an immigration expert to find it m m mind-boggling that that what we're discussing is the definition of a cage, right? It's like uh, uh, if 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 a mesh fence is a cage. Well, I mean, I think by all means, uh, a mesh fence, wire fence enclosing a small space, a small space, uh, is called a cage. Um, now, there, there's two types of incarceration spaces at the border, the, the, what is called colloquially in Spanish the yeleras, or ice boxes, and then the perreras, or dog pounds. And uh, the dog pounds are even more cage-like than the ice boxes, and that is where family separation uh, this uh, past summer uh, was, was um, hap well, well, it happened but it, w it was also where it was documented more, um, more thoroughly for the first time. So, 
I say this because it is important to point out that maybe the only true thing that uh, that, that Nielsen said is is that this has been going on for years, and it's true. That doesn't make it acceptable in any way, uh, or more acceptable. But but it has been going on for years, and family separation was going on during the Obama era, and the ice boxes existed, and so did the Pereira. So, um, so I guess the question is really, why does it take so much for us to finally commit to the daily task of denouncing the atrocities happening at the border, and not only at the border, but also all around us in detention spaces where undocumented people are being held for way longer than they are supposed to. And I think that we need to reframe, start reframing a lot of our questioning around immigration and place it in the context of the discussion of mass incarceration and the prison industrial com complex, which is really uh, what is happening. There is a lot of people profiting from incarcerating the most silenced portion of the USA population. Um, before I end, uh, you are an, um, uh, an artisan of words. You are a wordsmith, a beautiful writer. <clears throat> the power of words. So often the press uses the language of the powerful. President Trump announces there's a national emergency, and so that is repeated over and over again. And he defines the emergency as people coming over the border, so he wants to put up a wall. But what about the national emergency of children who continue to be separated from their parents? Hundreds of children, according to Trump administration's own numbers. Indeed, there are still many lost children, lost in the sense that this, this system has lost them, this administration has lost track of them, and it is to be held accountable for that, of course. Um, I mean, they are creating the national emergency. It's a human rights emergency at the border, and as I said earlier, also in, in the hundreds of detention spaces. By the way, there's always more and more, because more and more congressional appropriations are going to Homeland Security and then to ICE, and that into contracts with, with fundamentally one company that owns 65 percent of immigration detention spaces, which is CoreCivic, right? So this will continue, because it's profitable, unless we really, as a society, start uh, committing to a daily pushback and start understanding this in the much wider context of mass incarceration. Your daughter is nine years old, um, the age of many children who were separated. Did she ask mm -hmm. you about what was happening, and how did you talk to her about it? Yeah, it's a difficult question. She does ask, and she lives in a household uh, where it's all women. We, my mother, my niece, my friend, we, we, basically she's growing up uh, among very political and very active woman. Uh, t today we have a, a big woman's dinner at home, and they get very political. And so she, she, she's growing up in a context where she's hearing a lot of these things. And she would be hearing a lot of things anyway, because it's all over the news and it's on the headlines. And uh, so, I, I mean, what I have come to um, think is, is that Although I, it's, it's my responsibility to protect her innocence as much as I can, it's also my responsibility to give her the instruments, the intellectual and emotional instruments, to find agency within herself and not, and not see the world with terror, but um, to see injustice as an opportunity to engage uh, with the world and with agency. And I, and I think that. Um, so far, I think I'm doing a good job. She's an amazing kid. <laughs> and finally, what was it like to write your first novel in English? It's weird, because it's not really—I mean, it is the first novel that I write fully in English. But I—, I when I was five years old, we lived in South Korea. So the f I Why did you travel so much? For different reasons. Uh, my, my parents worked in NGOs for a long time. And then in South Korea and South Africa, my father was a, as a diplomat. Uh, but I must say that it's, it was really for different reasons, and often it was for my mother's job. And uh, usually in uh, media spaces, uh, people talk about my, my father, as if my mom didn't exist. Uh, so I really want to say that. I'm also the daughter of my mother. Um, and we moved around a lot because of them. Then I ended up moving by myself. I, I went to boarding school in high school, and I, I went to boarding school in, in India. And that was by myself, and then I, I ended up 
in Spain and France also by myself uh, and then here. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I was five when, when we moved to Korea and that's where I learned to read and write. So I learned how to read and write in English before I did so in Spanish. So all my life I wrote in English. I studied my PhD here in the U.S. Um, when I decided to write in Spanish, it was a, a political and emotional decision, my first book in Spanish um, in, my, in my early 20s. And, but all my notes for all my books have always been a complete bilingual mess, basically. So I, I write, I mean, sometimes I don't even finish a sentence in the same language in que le empecé, you know. So it's a, in which I started it, right? So it's, that's how, I mean, there's 60 million Hispanics in the U.S. Uh, I would say most of them are probably bilingual. That's the way that a Hispanic uh, Anglo mind works, um, sort of between the two languages. So all my, all my notes have always been in the two languages. And my, my previous book, Tell Me How It Ends, I wrote in English. Then I self-translated it to Spanish. This one I wrote in English uh, after attempting to write it in Spanish, the Spanish, English, nothing was working. One day English worked better than Spanish, and I just, I just followed that. Um, and I tried to self-translate this to Spanish, but it didn't work. And finally, on this International Women's Day, more about your mother. Your mother went back to Mexico in the 1990s? My mother decided, yeah, in the 1990s, uh, so in 1994, my 1994 was a very complicated year for, uh, for Mexico. Uh, it was the year uh, in which we became part of the, of the North American Trade Agreement. It was the year the, the, the presidential candidate had just been assassinated. Um, the Popocatépetl volcano was like uh, threatening to erupt, and more importantly, there was the Zapatista uprising in southern Mexico, in Chiapas. And um, that year, my father had had been sent to to South Africa as an international observer with an NGO of the of the first democratic elections in South Africa. So he was in South Africa a lot. And my mom decided, or she started getting very deeply involved with the Zapatista uprising. And so there was a moment in which. Uh, my father, uh, on one hand, was asked to to open up the first embassy, uh, Mexican embassy in South Africa, because there there were no diplomatic relations between the two countries. While uh, there was apartheid, Mexico had a strong stance against apartheid. Um, and at the same time, my mother said, "I am not going to do anything that uh, that involves this government at all." And and she decided actually to to join the. Um, because the, that was the time of the pre. That was the that time was of the, the one-party state in Mexico. Yeah, there was a long time in which that was a one-party <laughs> state. So yeah, it's just in all our lives basically. Um, and so my mom went to Chiapas, my father to South Africa. Um, my in mother. In fact, it was the time of Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador beginning to rise. I think. I mean, not I, that I remember. Not yet. He was already in the scene, but uh, it was. I think two two elections later that he was candidate. But I may be wrong. I was a kid, so I, 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 there's a lot of murkiness But the Zapatistas there. were taking over town squares. It was the time of the Zapatista uprising. Absolutely. Did your mother join the Zapatistas? Well, she, in, in, in her capacity, right? Uh, she, she, she's an urban woman um, who is not an in, indigenous Chapaneca, so she could not be a Zapatista. She, like many other people that, that, that felt that this was the time where really Mexico could undergo a deeper change uh, and that its indigenous communities uh, could finally um, have the, the the life and the situation and the political organizations that that they had been seeking, and people joined to help. So my mom ha worked in a collective of women uh, led by uh, another woman called Ofelia Medina, and they based they moved to a place called La Realidad. The, it's called the Reality. That's what the town is called. Um, as this collective to basically work with women uh, and their children in 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 many different areas. But they, they were a collective basically supporting the Zapatista woman in the uprising. And where were you? I was in South Africa. <laughs> I was in South Africa. So what are you working on next? Will you travel around the country with this book? Yeah, I have a very, a very, I have like, the tour looks like a Rolling, t Rolling Stones tour, except without the glamour and the parties. <laughs> I'm going to many, many cities uh, in, the, in, in the U.S. and traveling with this novel and then, and then later in Europe. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not 
I, I'm, I'm, I'm making notes for the next thing. I'm not in a hurry. I'm, I've been researching and writing a lot about mass incarceration and mass immigration detention. I work now in a detention center for children teaching creative writing to a, a group of teenage girls. Um, here in New York? Here in New York, yeah. There's detention centers everywhere, and we don't know about it. Um, uh, when we were covering what was happening at the border, that was the time that the first children were being brought up, or it was n publicly known that the children were being brought in New York to various detention exactly. centers. Exactly, exactly. And the numbers are, I mean, back then, back in the Obama era, one, one must say this, too, it, there were around 2,000, 2,500, I don't know the exact number, who were detained in longer-term uh, shelters uh, run by ORR, they're still detention spaces, just a little bit more humane than, than the ones that, um, that are uh, overseen by ICE. But right now, it's closer to 13,000 children in, in these detention centers. And the girls that I work with um, uh, have often been in that space for more than eight months. And How old are they? The ones that I work with are between 13 and 16. And they're alone? They're alone. Sometimes, if they have siblings, their sibling is allowed to be in the same. They're, they're, they're in different cottages. Um, sometimes their younger siblings are allowed to be in there with them so that they're not separated from their siblings. But a lot of them go from one facility to the next. Uh, so and where are their parents? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I also cannot ask too many questions in there, and I don't ask them anything about their immigration story, because if they say anything within my workshop or write anything within the workshop that contradicts, even if it's a fiction workshop when I'm teaching them, what they said at the border, that would, of course, um, uh, be in their detriment. Well, I want to thank you so much for spending this time. Valeria thank Luiselli you. is an award-winning writer. Her latest book, Lost Children Archive, is fiction. Her previous books include Tell Me How It Ends, an essay in 40 questions, Faces in the Crowd, Sidewalks, and The Story of My Teeth. This is Democracy Now! To see part one of our discussion, go to democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.